Well, as you saw in Catherine Cullen's report earlier in the news, tonight was debate night in the Quebec election. So let's get the at issue take on it. Andrew's in Washington tonight. Bruce is in Ottawa. Chantel is in Montreal, where she had a front row seat. Well, you start us, Chantel. Did anything happen tonight that fundamentally shifts the way that uh, campaign was heading? It uh, probably did not change the trend. I don't think that uh, the, the, the people who watched the debate uh, thinking they were going to vote one way have changed their minds. And that is really important, Peter, because uh, the, the, the momentum going into the debate uh, was behind the Liberals. Uh, and I think that uh, Philippe Couillard tonight, the Liberal leader, had a better night than uh, PQ leader Pauline Marois. I don't think that she managed to uh, give the assurance that two-thirds of Quebecers would have wanted to hear that she would not hold a referendum in the next mandate in a way that convinced uh, anyone that uh, does not already support her. So overall, I think a better night for the Liberals than for the PQ. And one thing is more certain after this debate, there are four parties and four leaders who were on the set tonight, but it is a two-way race between the PQ and the Liberals. All right. Um, you know, I only saw the first hour, but in what I did see, uh, Marois seemed a bit rattled uh, in, in the various exchanges. I'm not sure whether that kept going through the two hours, but Andrew, what was your uh, take on it all? She was. She consistently came under three-on-one attack on a range of issues, and she did look rattled at times. I think more importantly is it locked in this dilemma that she's been facing from the election before then, months before then, which is that at a time as this issue is, this election is polarizing around this question of the referendum and sovereignty, et cetera, uh, the Federalist vote is increasingly coalescing behind the Liberals, whereas the so sovereignty movement remains divided. It's divided on left-right lines, and you saw that, of course, visibly with Francoise David poking at her from the left on questions of, of, of you know, social solidarity and that sort of thing. But it's also divided on the, you know, full steam ahead with a referendum or go slow. And she keeps trying to straddle that, as she must, because she doesn't want to alienate that two-thirds of Quebecers, as Chantel said, who don't want the referendum. But the more she does so and the more uncomfortable she looked, as she did today, having to trot out this line about there'll be no referendum until Quebecers want one, I think increasing the issue for her personally is going to be trust. She doesn't look trustworthy on this issue. Uh, Francois Legault was hitting her on some other issues where she'd, she'd broken promises on the health tax. And if you're, as a leader, if, you're, if, if trust becomes a serious problem for you, then you're, I think you're having problems across a range of issues, not just on the sovereignty question. Bruce? Well, Peter, I thought it was a stimulating debate to watch. There were four uh, quite effective, I thought, and articulate leaders on stage there. And often when you watch these debates, it's hard to know who's making any progress, in part because most often they're trying just to avoid getting knocked down. That wasn't the case tonight. Uh, all four of them were really trying to, uh, to score some points at the expense of uh, the ones that they thought were the most strategic targets for them. Uh, on the whole, I guess I felt that uh, Madame Marois uh, escaped more serious damage on sovereignty uh, than she could have uh, endured. Mr. Couillard escaped more serious damage on the whole corruption issue than he could have endured. Uh, if, if people watching were tempted to vote for Madame Marois, they might have found in her animation and her prosecution of her issues uh, the reassurance they were looking for. But if they were tempted to support Mr. Couillard, and this is to Chantal's point, the trend has been towards the Liberals. If they were tempted to support him, it, did they see what they wanted to see in him? And I think the answer is probably uh, more yes than no, that he probably emerged as the, as the winner tonight. But all four of them handled themselves well, I thought. You know, it's interesting watching campaigns sometimes because one image can sort of become the dominant image of the campaign. And I wonder whether this one, I want to show this, didn't happen tonight. It happened a couple of days ago and is now sort of known as Le Chauve. Uh, uh, watch this. It's, uh, it, it's Pierre Pelodeau uh, seemingly about to go up to the microphone uh, when he was kind of pushed aside uh, by uh, Pauline Marois. Um, we're going to see that here. We got that? And it's just that little thing had become such a symbol of what was happening inside the PQ campaign. And is it still that symbol, Chantal? Oh, yes, uh, very much so. And, and the issue of uh, Mr. Pelado's uh, recruitment came up tonight. All three other leaders told Pauline Marois that he should uh, divest his interest in the 40% of the Quebec media that uh, he controls as, as a, a media owner. And you could just sense that there were living rooms where 
PQ supporters were kind of throwing tomatoes at the TV. Why did we go and get this guy? Because what gelled the ballot box question around the referendum was Mr. Pedado's arrival on the scene and his, you know, I want to ha create a country gesture. And if the PQ loses this election that has been Pauline Marois to lose for months before it was called, the pivotal moment will be her decision to bring Mr. Pelado on the scene and to focus the debate on sovereignty by doing that. Yeah, really? A huge miscalculation. Yeah, you really got to wonder why she did that, Andrew. I, I mean, if I were the Liberals, I'd be running that fist pump of Pelado's as my burning image. I mean, I mentioned they're divided in these two different ways, and the more they try to fix one of those problems, the worse they make the other. So they need to broaden their base because they've been being eaten into it from the left by, by Quebec Solidaire. So they bring in Pelado to reach out to the right. In so doing, of course, they risk alienating their own left wing. So they say, well, it's not about that. It's about, you know, the big tent of sovereignty where right wingers and left wingers can all get together. And the minute you do that, then you start, as I say, alienating those, those soft nationalists who don't want to don't want to deal with this question. So I think th this is the he crystallized what was already an existing dilemma for them, they were trying to break out of it by bringing him in and in fact made it worse. All right, I, I want to do cover quickly two other topics. So Bruce, you start us off on this one. Let me show you a clip from last night in Edmonton. Watch this, Alison Redford. With a profound optimism for Alberta's future, I am resigning as Premier of Alberta, effective this Sunday evening. She had been under a lot of pressure, everybody knows that, but still it was a shocker last night when it happened. Bruce, what's the lesson of the Redford resignation? Well, I think, Peter, there's been a tension in the province of Alberta that's been building up for the better part of about 10 years between a significant group of voters who say our government's not as conservative as we want it to be and another group of voters, including a lot who've arrived in the province, who say our government's not as progressive as we would like it to be. Um, so that tension exists and surrounds the incumbent government and has uh, perplexed, I think, leaders before Ms. Redford. But one thing that voters on both sides of that divide can agree on, really two things, is that they like leaders who are down to earth and who are frugal. And when I say frugal, I mean personally frugal. They, uh, they almost seem to care more uh, about uh, spending $45,000 on an extravagant trip than missing a deficit or a fiscal calculation by about $2 billion. So she paid a price, I think, for being seen as not very down to earth and not careful enough uh, with those expenses that she controlled personally. Chantal? Well, she also was elected uh, thanks to a shift uh, in the Liberal or the opposition vote towards her and her party to fend off the Wild Rose uh, party. The problem is that uh, it may have been easier to get elected, in the case of Alison Redford, than to run her caucus and her government, because she was trying to run a caucus that is, has members who are rattled on the right while she the people who brought her to power were more on the left of the party. Uh, I think that uh, probably exacerbated the tensions and made the MPs less likely, MPPs less likely to line up behind her. Andrew? I think ultimately the lesson of this is caucus matters. I mean, we can talk about the right-left dimension and her own mishandling of public funds and her inability to deal with criticism of that and the resulting odium into which she and her party have fallen. But Ultimately, if you get out of touch with your caucus, if you treat them, you know, like peons and you take them for granted, they're at some point going to reach a point of in, uh, where they won't take anymore, particularly when they think they're going to lose their seats. Uh, but part of the problem is that she was brought in, she was elected over the heads of the caucus. She had only support of one MLA. Uh, and naturally, if, you, if, if, if that leader is being imposed on a group of people, at some point they're going to say, well, we didn't order this. Uh, I think this is part of the lesson of this is... We need to take more seriously uh, the interests of caucus in choosing a leader. And certainly, it's a good day when caucus reasserts itself when they're being taken for granted. All right. Final topic. Um, I want to show you a tweet uh, yesterday from uh, Stephen Harper's Twitter account. Here it is. It's the announcement, basically, of Joe Oliver becoming the new finance minister following Jim Flaherty, uh, and also a link to where you could see him being interviewed by one of the prime minister's people. Uh, the reason this is interesting is because he wasn't interviewed, uh, at least at uh, Rideau Hall, by anybody from the media who were kept out of both the ceremony and the traditional opportunity to uh, question a new cabinet minister, especially uh, a senior new cabinet minister, uh, like a finance minister. Um, a, a lot of 
pondering now as to what this means in terms of the relationship between the Prime Minister's office and reporters in Ottawa and what it signals as we move forward uh, to an election next year. Uh, Bruce on this? Well, I think a charitable explanation might be that the government wanted to uh, let the first day at least be a discussion, a day where discussion centered on Mr. Flaherty and his accomplishments as finance minister. But I think the broader question really is the important one here. This is a government that has been uh, enormously fascinated by the idea of controlling and packaging its message. Um, it's been abusive of taxpayers' dollars, I think spending almost a half a billion dollars at last count on advertising its, its charms to voters. Uh, an extraordinary degree of control of the relationship with the media, needlessly antagonistic in my view, and all of that, all of that to uh, have resulted in a loss of about a third of the support in any uh, client situation that I've observed, that would have been a signal to overhaul and really re-examine the approach to communication. Instead, what the government seems to be doing is doubling down on this idea of control. All right, we've only got about a minute left. Andrew? I don't think the media is or should be the issue here, frankly. I think a, any government, any party has the right to put out its own type of message. But a government is presumably acting in some respect in the public square. When they appoint a finance minister, it's not their finance minister, it's the public's finance minister. And everything surrounded this seemed to say this is none of the public's business, this is just a private little affair of our own. The last one I would say is it sure didn't seem like they wanted to showcase this particular finance minister, which raises interesting questions about how long he's going to be there. Chantel? I agree. The issue isn't the media and the PMO. The issue is the government's accountability to the people. Uh, you cannot substitute government propaganda paid by taxpayers for the right of the public to see how business is conducted and who is conducting it. And we are talking about the second most important uh, person in the cabinet, the Minister of Finance. So uh, I find that troubling from the public's perspective. And, you know, it doesn't look like a one-off. So uh, you, you have to wonder what, what's next, how they're going to carry forward with this approach if they really are doubling down, Bruce. And finally, we should say that after going to all the trouble to hiding Joe Oliver, then a, some of our colleagues at Canadian Press bumped into him on the street later in the day yesterday and were able to get a couple of quotes uh, from him. Uh, Andrew's in Washington tonight. Thank you. Uh, Chantelle in Montreal and Bruce in Ottawa.